So what are we going to cover today? We're going to cover student data during this section. First thing we're going to talk about is attending versus subsidy, where the data comes from, how the data is used, and how to find and review your student data. So the one important thing to first remember is that the data for enrollment freezes on October 1st. That means anybody that comes after October 1st is not included, but it also means that anybody that leaves after October 1st is not removed. So October 1st is that freeze date. Um, that's when we collect all of the data. That's the snapshot that you're reporting into us. The due dates are extremely important. The EPS is based on statewide data. So until we get everybody's data, we can't even begin to run any portion of the EPS formula. So that's why we have the due dates and that's why they're important. Um, the sooner you get your budget, uh, your data to us, the sooner we can run the EPS and the sooner you get your allocations for your budgets. Those two dates sort of back up against each other. You need your budget allocation data and we need your student data before we can start. I'm going to interrupt already just for one quick thing. Sorry. Let's wanted me. What I, what I just wanted to say before she started, and I didn't, some of you probably are thinking, why do I need to know about how to do student data uh, collection and validation? Because you don't actually do the student data collection or the staff data collection. And so I actually already had that conversation with somebody here. The reason that you, I think, should, should pay attention to this and understand it is because if the data that's put in for the students and the staff are not accurate, when we run the calculation, it's going to be wrong. And you're going to come back to us in February and say, hey, we have more students than this, or hey, we have a lot more economically disadvantaged than this. But that's what was reported to us, and that's what was certified. So I'm asking you to partner with whoever does enter your data and to learn a little bit about how to validate that data so that you can either work with them or do it yourself to ensure that our data that we have is correct so that our calculations can be accurate. Now I'm going to let you go, and I'm not going to say another word. <laughs> you all heard that. <laughs> I'm not going to read the slide to you, but these are the data um, spots that we collect for enrollment. The most important one is probably attending versus subsidy. Attending are those students who actually go to your school and are educated at your schools. Subsidy is based on where students live. Those are the students each municipality is responsible for. Attending data is used on page one of the ED 279 to get to that um, calculation to use as we go forward in the ED 279 for the elementary and secondary pupil rates. The others are um, flags that are given to students to put them in the right buckets so that we know where they belong, if they're special ed, if they're CTE, if they're um, lear English learners, those are all flags. We need those done accurately. So we put them in the correct budget so you get your correct allocation. So the data that we use comes from you, comes from your SAUs. We take the data that is certified by your superintendent, and that is what's used in the EPS formula. The data is submitted and certified by you. It's entered through Synergy, which is the state student information system, and it's housed in NEO. You can access your student data to review through your NEO dashboard. If you don't have access, that is something you need to request, and that will be covered later in a different presentation. You will only have access to your student data. You cannot see anybody else's. It's um, restricted to the students within your SAU. Excuse me, Donna. Careful. You're on the wires. I didn't want you to make sure. We just had this conversation okay. about tripping and falling. So to begin with, how do you find your data to review? Where do you go? So from the NEO dashboard, you go to your student data, go to students in the blue bar, and then you go to student reports. Oops. 
And slide three is sort of a, a map to show you how to actually get to your reports from that NEO dashboard. So once you're inside your student data in your student reports, we recommend that you look at both the summary count and the detailed count to review each of your student data. So here's a, a quick snapshot of a summary count of students. You can see that this is the information that was put into Synergy. It shows you, one important thing it shows you is right at the bottom in the yellow box, it gives you two years of comparison. So it shows you the two most recent years of October data, and then it shows you the number difference and the percent difference. So this is a really good place to just take a quick look to see if something really looks odd. Because if you have a high percentage or a high number of student differences between the two years, you definitely need to look into that and make sure it's okay. When we see these things, we're gonna reach out to you and say, are you sure this is right? So if that's done before it's entered, that saves a little bit of time in the process. So the detailed, uh, the student data summary is the aggregate count, is that grouping of students by those flags and it's the aggregate numbers. This is the snapshot of the detailed report. The detailed report gives you line by line every student that was entered into Synergy. You can see all the information that was entered about that student and see if there's something that looks a little off. The great thing about this report is that you can download it into Excel. So you can download it, you can filter it, you can search it, and it will really help you find where those student errors might be. And this is important because like Paula said, even those small errors can make a difference in the allocation. So we want to make sure you get the allocation you're um, supposed to get, and we want to make sure everybody else gets the right allocation. So again, we're going to go over just the, a few of the high-level student data. And again, the attending counts, attending students are the important one for page one of the ED-279. These are the students that physically attend your schools, and they can be from your local district, or they can be tuition from outside of your district. And the, again, those are used on page one of the ED-279. And we will be going over page one and two of the ED-279 a bit later in much more detail. So I'm just going to do a high level um, show through of the student data. So this is the section one of an ED-279. And I'm showing you how this relates to your student data reports. So on the right for you is the, e the ED-279 1A student data counts. Mm -hmm. And on the left is that student summary detail report. And you can see in the um, boxes that are highlighted that the ones in blue are previous year and the ones in um, pink are the, um, the current year. I think I got that right. Yes. So we wanted to show you that those numbers that we use on the ED-279 come directly from the summary and detailed reports that you enter into Synergy, your SAU enters into Synergy. So this starts the calculation of the, ED, of the EPS formula. So if these attending data students are not correct, the rest of your EPS allocation is not going to be correct. And the data that we use for the ED-279 1A by statute, we use the two most current October 1 attending, total attending counts. Those are broken up into four different grade groupings. We have pre-KK, one to five, six to eight, and nine to 12. So you can see in the top table, those are the calculations showing the averages between those two most recent years. The statute also gives a little caveat that says, 
if your total number of students dropped by more than 10% between those two years, then we will look at the three-year average. And we'll compare the three-year average to the two-year average for each one of those grade groupings, and we will give you the higher number of students. So it's not one or the other. We compare each group, and we give you the highest number of students within those two-year and three-year. So once we have those attending counts, that's where we start doing the calculations. This is just a quick, again, overview of the page one data. And we use those total attending counts to use in the ratios to determine how many FTE percent, how many FTE you receive for EPS allocation. This is what the EPS is saying you will need. Uh, Paula will be going over staff data in much more detail. I'm just trying to show you where those numbers align. So once we have the total for each of those grade groupings, they're divided by the ratio number, again, from statute, that tells us for each one of those grade groupings, how many, how to determine the FTE for those staff positions. That's done for each level, and then they're added together to give us an EPS FTE for each staff group. If you have fewer than 1,200 total students at your school, that you also says we reduce all of those staff grouping ratios except teachers by 10%. And this allows for SAUs without as many opportunities for economies of scale to have a little bit more FTE for their students because we understand the schools that are running, you all need these positions. You all need these no matter how big or small you are. And again, to separate subsidizable students, those are the students where the student lives. These are the municipalities that are responsible to pay for the education of these students. They are students who are in your district. They are superintendent transfers. They are tuition students. And they are also pre-K estimated counts for approved pre-K programs. So that's one that is used in subsidy that is not used in attending. And on page two of the ED 279, we use subsidizable students. And again, you can see between the two, the summary detailed report and ED 279 page two, those are the numbers that align between current and previous years. That's where those numbers come from. You may note that there are different grade groupings for the subsidy counts. We look at pre-K, we look at K-8, and we look at 9-12. For K-12, to 12, we use a two-year average, again, of the two years, two most recent years of subsidy student counts. For pre-K, we use current year plus estimated. So pre-K does not use an average. It uses pre-K current counts. So for FY25, that was October 1, 2023. And then we add in those approved um, estimated students. And those pre-K numbers are used throughout the formula on page two. And the errors are just showing you where those numbers are used for pre-K. All the other ones use those two-year averages that are up above. And I think that's it for, for the first part. Um, again, we'll be going over sections one and two in much more detail. And this was just sort of a quick overview to show you where that student data comes from. Thank you, Donna, that was great. Does anybody have any questions before we move on? I am gonna clarify one thing uh, that, uh, I know, I stay quiet, right? The October 1st date isn't necessarily a freeze date, but it is a date that that's the day when we take the count of all your students on October 1st. Where are they and what are their demographic? What is the demographic situation on that date? And then of course the collection goes throughout all of October to make sure that we can get that correct. And then we do freeze all of our data to use in our calculations by November 15th. So all of the student data, all of the staff data, 
See, okay. This is Allie. I love Allie. You probably know Allie. Allie is the uh, trainer for the Meadows Help Desk. She's great. Meadows support, <laughs> support team. They don't help. They're support. Okay. Got it. Uh, this is being recorded. So, Madam's <laughs> uh, support team. Anyway, we we use terms differently. Uh, she wants you to know the close date because she doesn't want you to wait till the freeze date. And I get it. I don't. I don't blame her. I'm the same way. I would rather you go to the close date. The close date for all of our data, the day that we need it in, the end date of collections, October 30, staff and student and financial. I won't talk about the freeze date two weeks later. But if after that close date, you find something wrong and it's within that two week period, call me, we'll fix it, okay? That's all I'll say. <laughs> all right, so thank you very much, Donna. Great job. Gonna student data can cost up to a million dollars in funding and we don't have that to give until the next year. So errors can't always be fixed in the same year. And so it can cost a lot of money for the districts. We don't want to see that happen. We want to make sure that the calculations are being done as they should with the, with the accurate data. I'm going to try to stay in one place. It's hard for, well, hard for me, especially because I'm so short. Um, but I'm going to, I am going to try. Okay. So. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk to you about staff. Staff is wonderful. The staff component of the ED 279 you know what? Yep. Uh, is um, okay. related to EPS staff. Some staff account for EPS and some don't. Well, that means, seems silly. Why wouldn't all staff count for EPS? We, we need all staff for the funding. Well, they do all count for EPS, but only those that that are part of operating a school for regular education are the ones that we use in the on page one in the ED 279 to help determine a per pupil cost to operate a school in your district. That's where the separation comes out. Special ed is done later. Transportation is done later. All of those staff count but not for operating a school, general education only, page one. That's where your EPS rate is determined, which then is the multiplier on page two for all of your subsidizable students. So page one is extremely important determining a multiplier that we're using for each individual SAU. I brought this map here. We brought our big one that we have, and I think they are. So I brought the big one because it helps to see all of the SAUs that we that we calculate funding for. There are 200 and, 254 SAUs plus nine charter schools all over the state, except of course here. This is, this is just forest. And supposedly there are moose, but I was just up at we said lady didn't see it. <laughs> so um, I just think it's an interesting, helpful picture of all of the different uh administrative units in Maine and how they're how they are split up. So 266 school administrative units, um, all kinds of students, all kinds of staff. But each one is important. Each staff member is important because the formula uses their years of experience and their highest level of education because we use one salary matrix. We don't have all, we, we would not have the ability to look at what you actually pay and then calculate the formula. So we use one salary matrix. It's an average funding calculation, average funding salary for the eight categories. So because of that, the fact of making sure that your staff that, that are considered EPS yes on page one. In other words, there are staff that are used in calculating that EPS rate, that multiplier for your district, specific district. Everyone is done differently, set separately, individually. It's important to make sure that's accurate. 
Um, getting away from my thoughts here. So the eight categories are teachers, guidance, which includes social workers, uh, librarians, health, ed techs, library techs, clerical, and school admins, which are like principals. Those are the categories that are part of the, the funding formula to determine the cost of operating a school for general education. If you don't operate a school, the EPS rate is determined by looking at uh, the SAU EPS rates where your children that you are responsible for attend school. That's another discussion, which I can get into it if any of you have specific questions about that. So, the FTEs and how they're calculated. We're going to get into it specifically when we do our little practice session worksheets. Yay. Um, but the FTE is a specific, is, is in law. 15 to 1 is, is teachers. Uh, 350 to 1 or 250 to 1. I forget what they all are. But um, actually, I have one right here. Teachers normally 15 to 1, guidance 350 to 1, librarians 800 to 1, et cetera. And to determine, this is to determine not how many staff you should have at your school. It's not telling you what you need to have for staff. It's saying what the essential programs and services formula is going to fund to have an adequate level of funding so that all your students can meet the learning results. That's what that is. So even though we, the formula might say you should have uh, 32.41 teachers in your six to eight grade level because you have 551 students. That doesn't mean that you can't have more or less. It's up to the locals to decide how they use that money and how much staff they need and where they need the staff. The formula is set up to determine how much is necessary for every child to be able to achieve the learning results using the what, what were called essential programs and services. Now that was created back in FY6 or before that. And so it's being reviewed again now and it gets each component gets reviewed every three years and changes happen if they are put through legislature to have to change. But every component of the for formula is in, is in statute. I actually brought my pretty purple book today to show you the new version of the Title 28 statute. Um, for this this year, and it changes every year, so they have to make a new book every year. Somebody's making a lot of money on that. <laughs> so maybe I should get into that field. Um, so again, the formula is designed to provide a base level of funding, and then the locals, because it's a local control state, determine whether that funding is enough, or if you if you need more which would be additional local, or if you don't even need to use all of it, and, the, and then you can, you can keep some of it for other purposes as long as you don't go over certain percentages. Yes? We have a Zoom question. EPS does not include admin at the... at the county level, I guess, such as superintendency role, et cetera, correct? Not correct. Uh, EPS does include, if you look at section D on page one, other support for per pupil costs. So that includes substitute teachers, supplies and equipment, professional development, instructional leadership support, co and extracurricular student activities, system administration. That's your superintendent and your business office. That's your business manager. That, that, that piece of it is your soup, is that area and then operations maintenance. Those are all given an allocation of a per pupil funding. So that, that is included in the cost to operate a school. Thank you, that's a great question. And it's, it's, it's definitely uh, often misunderstood because it's kind of hidden on that page down below and it, it doesn't get as much um, uh, attention as the eight categories that we have to actually look at each individual staff member. So uh, let's see, ratios of staff to students. So again, this is to determine how many, how many staff you're going to need 
just to have a basic. It's not telling you what to do. So if, if your school board says, EPS says you, we can only have 142 teachers, we need to cut staff, you can try to help them understand. <laughs> That's not what this is saying. This is for funding. We're gonna allocate funding for that many. It's the same way all over the state. And then you decide locally what's best for you, what you need for staffing. Make sense? That's always a big question. So I really wanted to help make sure everybody understood that. So on our on our, pay, our website page, we do have information about what those eight positions are specifically in staff. So like the teachers, there's five different in, this is where Allie comes in, how you enroll them or not enroll, enroll a student, how you enter them into the staff data system. Um, the ones that, that are EPS, yes, are classroom teacher, literacy specialist, long-term substitute teacher, I can talk about that in a minute. Uh, Title I teacher and English language learner teacher. And as long as, if you, if you, can, you probably can't see the exclusions very well, but for those of you that have it in front of you, um, they can't be special ed, they can't be CTE, they can't be gifted and talented. Uh, they have to be, they can't be terminated. We're not gonna pay you for terminated staff. Uh, they can't be pending. So we're not gonna pay for staff that isn't actually started working yet. We're only counting staff for this purpose that have that are actually, so if you have positions that are open, we're not gonna add those in. However, I will show you something a little later. The way the formula works, if your total count of positions is less than what the formula is recommending we pay you for or allocate funding for, we are going to increase your funding to get you up to that level. If, however, you have more staff than what we're going to fund you at, it will decrease it to get you to that level. So it works both ways. If you so you have if you have empty positions and it is less than what EPS will fund, EPS is going to give you more funding over the ones that you have filled. I'll let you absorb that for a minute and make sure you understand it. So this document explains what the ratios are, what the um, Positions are in in the staff uh, neo staff collection. What do we want to call it? Neo staff neo staff collection. That's perfect. Uh, so all of that's in there. And then this was uh, I thought this was a great slide that Donna created uh, to explain how we determine each one and the calculation that's done uh, to determine what the actual number is. So in the one I'm looking at, they have 185. Uh, Pre-K K average students for the last two October counts. So at 15 to one, that means they should have 12.33 pre-K K teachers. You take the um, 185 and you divide it by 15, and that means that says 12.33. It's literally that simple to determine for the calculation of how many where EPS will fund you at. And we're going to do a little practice later, so you'll see what I mean. And then here's an example of the salary matrices that we use. Uh, these are, again, available online um, every year. It's updated every year for um, any changes to legislation. Like recently, we had the 40,000 requirement, and the APS matrix was updated to having a minimum of 40,000. That was FY24. FY25 now will have has a has that 40,000 increased by the inflation factor. And so every year, the salary scale that we use for the funding is updated by an inflation factor. And then if there's a change to legislation, or if there's um, a review that comes from uh, MAPRI that indicates that the salaries should be adjusted and it goes through approval through the legislature, then it will be changed according to that as well. Just taking a pause. I know it's it's fun stuff, right? This is hard to keep the fun in funding, I have to tell you. So here's the key. How do you check that? Well, we have an app for that. <laughs> I mean, Allie has a, has, a, has a place for that. You don't own that? 
So if, <laughs> if you don't have access, I think Donna mentioned this in hers, please ask your superintendent to give you access because if I really think it's important for somebody to be checking these staff to make sure that you're not way off. Here's our recommendation of how to check for, for issues with your staff data. Go into Neo, you click on staff. And then you click on certification report. The certification report is going to either be the current fiscal year, or you can change it to a prior year. There's also a live, <coughs> Natalie, can you help me with that? There's a live data. Has a live data. And that's so the current one that you're doing now likely is going to be in live data as you go in. And you'll see it, it will show you information here about all of these categories. The one, of course, that I'm most interested in is the EPS category. Is that one accurately done? Is it is it correct? So I put a little arrow here, and there was a little scroll down sign on it, but you can't see it because it's white. But if we scroll down on this page, so click on the certification report, scroll down, and you'll get to this little box that says EPS staff. What this box does on that report is shows you what the actual EPS totals are for those eight categories. If you compare those with your prior year, ED279, page one, actual FTEs, that should be the difference. The difference is what you should expect. So for instance, this one, the um, teachers declined from 175 to 161. That's the actual, not what EPS is saying. It's actual. Is that accurate? Was it supposed to decline or should it have gone up? So for each of these categories, hopefully you have an idea of what your staffing should be and whether or not it was supposed to change and how much it was supposed to change from the prior year. Because this will impact funding if your staff, if your EPS staff data uh, identification is incorrect. Uh, the other thing that I would point out is one of those things that we see, two common errors that we see in staff data collection, ed techs. A lot of our ed techs are special ed. Well, special ed ed techs should never appear on page one. If they are a, if, if your ed techs are split, then please split them in NEO staff so that they're part regular ed and part special ed because the regular ed portion should only be, reg the page one, ED279 should only be regular ed, never special ed. But we see a lot of times they'll put it put in these ed techs and not bother to identify them as special ed. And then that actually significantly costs funding on page one. Because you're you'll be way over what EPS is going to fund you at. And so we'll be we'll be reducing it. Make sense? The other common error is with the, the clerical staff administrative assistance. EPS only funds administrative assistance at the school level on page one because this is operate a school, to operate a school in your, in your SAU. So the district level administrative assistants are not counted here. They're counted elsewhere, but they're not counted here. And so if you have an administrative assistant um, in the staff system, but they aren't assigned a school, they won't count here. So if they're supposed to be assigned a school, please make sure they are so that they will count. And if they're not, make sure they're not. Does any of all of that make sense? A lot of words I know I just said, but just trying to help under, help you understand that page one is all about the cost to operate a school, an actual school building for general education. So what are those criteria? So those are the staff that should be counting on page one. Another, uh, another report that I recommend is the Staff Details Report, FTE. I recommend that somebody, if not you, go in and download this into Excel. Oh, I say that right there. Look, download into Excel. Then you will have all of the staff data and you'll be able to see, hey, oh, that person's special ed, but they're not marked as special ed. You'll be able to see it in an Excel spreadsheet, do the filtering, do all the examinations that you can, do the counting, make sure it's right. 
download that, that Excel report as often as you need to, um, and then update and correct prior to the um, due date of October 30th of staff data. So we can have the correct data before we start calculating. And there's an example of how to do it and how to download it into Excel. Just one of the steps. And of course, I always like to tout the Metams support team uh, because they provide a great deal, a plethora of helpful information. So here is links to their page, specifically their staff information. And as you can see, there is a ton of guides that we can't read from this distance, but when you click on it in your computer, you will be able to. They have a lot of stuff, as well as they have the illustrious Allie, who is very helpful. And the, uh, the rest of the uh, support team is also very uh, helpful. So I just wanna make sure you know how to reach out to them as well. They are the ones that manage the collection of the data and can tell you how to put things into the system. We are terrible at that, but we can tell you how the data is being used. And here's my little uh, plea. Accurate data equals accurate funding calculations. I'm begging you, somehow get involved in the, in the, in the uh, validation of your data, if you are able. The end. Yes. Uh, quick question, are, is the data collection as of date, the submittal date and the freeze date the same for staff as students? So not exactly. Students is in October 1. Where are they on October 1? Staff is for the fiscal year, which starts July 1 of this, of this year, and update it and correct it as you need to. For EPS, perp now, staff data changes throughout the year. That should actually be updated all year long. However, for EPS purposes, we have to take a snapshot of that data. A few years ago, in 2019, pre COVID, was it 2019? We had a great big uh, training where we had everybody calculate their own individual SAU 8279. And it was great training, but it was very complicated. So today we're doing the same one together, and then you can bring it back to yours. Okay, so we chose our 275. Is anybody from 75 here? Well, you're the guinea pig. So, <laughs> 70, uh, I didn't choose 78. Uh, sure. I actually purposely chose a district that has one district that is below the mill, mill rate when we get to section four. Is that what they so, that's why I purposely chose that district. Yeah. Uh, yours, everybody's at the mill rate, 58. So, all right. So, we're going to start with sections one and two. So, the first missing piece. And this is going to be interactive, and I should probably walk around with this. Um, the first missing piece here is attending pupil one to five from the October 2023 count. Anybody find that? Eight seventy. I heard eight seventy. What? So if you if you put that number in and add it with your calculator, add the three numbers here together, it should come out to 15. Oh, this is not going to work for me with my eyes. It should come out to 1586. If you have the right number. I'm showing you where you get the data where it goes and how the calculation works. This is how we determine your section 1A. Let's, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna remove this and we're gonna see what the right number is. So the right number, 
goes in that spot was 870. Who got it right? Oh, yeah. I didn't put that out. Yeah, don't look up there to do it. That's on that screen. Oh, okay. Any, did anybody not get that one? It's okay. All right. So the next one at the end is the nine to twelve. Can you find that number on the on your data? Your data sheet will give you the number for 9 to 12, October 1, 2023 counts. Attending, by the way, remember these are attending students. Attending students are the ones that are attending a school, a school in your district if you operate schools. They're actually in a seat in your school buildings. Okay, expose, I mean, reveal. <laughs> You can just hit delete the top. Once you highlighted it, and then you get this case. I got it. There you go. 742. I'm sorry that this is. Can you see if you can make it bigger on the 100%? It really is. Oh, do you, do you want me to turn these off? Well, that, since we turned these off. Um, if we turn the lights out, are you guys going to stay awake? <laughs> Will it make it easier? Let's, let's check. Is that turning lights off? I'm guessing. Is that better? Just trying to figure out the light situation. Um, is that better or should I do another one? Do you want these off as well? Oh, the front ones. The front ones that are the round ones. Can we get I think that's oh, perfect. That's, that's perfect. <laughs> okay. Yes. Good? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Oh, yeah, that is better. I can even see it. All right. Where are we? Okay. So does everybody see, is any is everybody understanding where we're getting these numbers from? We showed you earlier how to check the attending counts on that summary report, that student, st student detail report. That's what this is. You've got the October 22, the October 23. It's the average of those two numbers that are used on this page that then is the multiplier or divider, I should say, to determine how much staff for each of these positions EPS will fund you for. Okay, so let's do one of those calculations. We're going to figure out how many teachers we need for the 185 average pre-K K students we have. We do that by taking 185 divided by 15. So I can show you. The 185 is the average pre-K K under pre-K K. The student to staff ratio is 15 to 1. You take 185 divided by 15, and it will tell you how many EPS will fund for your pre K K uh, teacher, teachers. Who's got a number? Yes? 12.34. Um, 12.33. So here's, here's a little uh, be careful when you're doing this. <laughs> And, and there's a lot of rounding that has to be done a certain way in order for the formula to work properly. So these are rounded to five numbers, but, but you're only seeing two. So some of, some of these are gonna be off a little bit just because of that. We have provided in the past, and I'm willing to provide to some of you, any of you actually, uh, actual Excel versions of your current formula that you can play with. Just give us some time to actually, it's, it's a manual thing we have to, to create. Mm -hmm. So, but we we're happy to do that if you if you reach out. Right, Don? I have page one. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> Click on the button. Okay. Any questions on that piece of it? So, that's the calculation. It's, yeah. 12.33. Yeah. So, the funding EPS at 15 to 1 with 8, 185 students attending 
is going to fund you for 12.33 pre-KK teachers. Now the formula adds them all together when we determine what you have for actual. We don't actually split it out by pre-KK one to five in the formula. We add them all together, okay? And that's where this line is coming from, where we take the 12.33, we add 52.32 from one to five, we add 32.41 for six to eight, we add 45.25 to get all the teachers, which in this case, EPS for a total of 724 average students, pre-K to 12, will allocate funding for 142, 0.32 teachers. You see that on your sheet? Mm -hmm. so nine to I gave them 9 to 12 total instead of having them do it? No, it's 724 is 9 to 12. The total is. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So I'm sorry. So the total teachers for, for pre K to 12 is total attending st students, 2349.5. And for, that, for those many attending students, EPS is going to fund 142.32 teachers. The line next to that says how many this district has actually, so in the staff data that we've collected, the ones that count EPS yes, that we talked about a few minutes ago, there are 161.6. Now, we're going to fund, based on the salary matrix, the years of experience and the level of education for each teacher. How do we decide which 142 we're going to choose to fund? We don't. So we look at all 161, and we look at the matrix, and we pull in the amount from the matrix based on their level of experience and their degree of uh, education, and that comes out to be SAU data. Uh, yeah, SAU data. So the SAU data in the EPS matrix when we when we do 161 staff teachers comes to be 10434000 But we're not going to fund you at that because we're only going to fund you at 142 So we just reduce it by to, to 88% of that. And then we split it for elementary and secondary by the percentage of students at the top. Up here. See that? Have I lost anybody? Following along okay? Sweet. So, did I do an example? Okay, what's the next one we have? The next empty line, I didn't print myself a copy of the empty line. All right. Oh, the actual MTE. You gotta get that off your data sheet. Thank you. <laughs> I gave myself the answer sheet and not the, not the questions. So the actual FTE for librarians, for, for um, all of them, how do you do that? Well, I, I lied a minute ago. I apologize. You don't need your, your data sheet. You just need to add the numbers on here. So along the librarian count, you add the pre-KK number of librarians, which is 0.23 to the 1 to 5, 1.11, to the 0.69 for 6 to 8, and to the 0.91 for 9 to 12. Sorry. Yep, that's, yeah, I apologize. Um, I, so I was right the first time. Right. I apologize. Please keep correcting me because I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling up here. <laughs> so we got 2.94 total librarians, and the actual, according to the data sheet, is two. Two. two, which means they have less than what EPS is going to fund them at. So we take those two and put them in the matrix, and that comes to 148,366. See that in the orange box? However, we're going to increase it by 47% because we're going to fund them more. So we actually provide funding at 217,000 instead of the 148. You see how that works? 
So please don't put in fake people for staffing. <laughs> it messes it up. Make sense, everybody? Okay. So the next one that I've um, put is to determine how many ed techs for six to eight. Anybody want to tell me how that how you do that? Anyone want to guess? Yeah. So for uh, six to eight average student. The 551. 551 and divided by the 312. Correct. You take the 551, the two-year average students, the six to eight, and divide it by the three we three 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 twelve uh FTE ratio uh, student staff to student ratio. And what do we get? Yes. The data in the actual FTE total and the SAU data and the ECS matrix is entered manually. Why not formula? Say that again. The data in the actual FTE total and the SAU, they're asking if the data in the actual FTE total and the SAU data in the ECS matrix is entered manually. And if no, why no formula? I still don't understand the question. I'm going to have to read it. The data in actual FTE total and SAU data. Oh, it's not actually entered manually in our EPS calculation. So it's just for today uh, and for an Excel spreadsheet that we create outside the system. The system does the calculating. So the system does the pulling from the data that's entered into NEO staff. So the actual data that you have in there, I mean, I mean the actual FTEs that you have in there is pulled from your NEO staff data and added to the calculation in the back end on in, in you know Cyberland. Um, but in order to show it and to do it here, we just have to enter them manually on the spreadsheet. We don't have a way of pulling it in yet. We're working on it. We're working on it. Any other questions? Okay, so the next blank we have is under clerical. That one we need to look up the actual on your data sheet. 14. So they have a few more than what EPS will fund at. And so that one, when you multiply it, um, 533. Now, again, if you wanted to take all your staff, and their years of experience and their level of education and our matrix, you should be able to come up with the same numbers that we have here. And if you don't, let me know because it's a problem. But if you don't want to do that work, I understand too. But they should match. It should match. And yes, we test them every now and then. So uh, let's see. The only other thing uh, we're going to talk about on this page is the computation of benefits. So the second. Section C is where we add in benefits for all of these staffing at the different levels. Um, and these are just benefit levels that research has determined. These are probably not the benefits levels you pay. They hopefully are closer than they used to be a couple of years ago. They got updated recently. So 26%, 40, 40, and 21. So we add in the cost of benefits for these staff. And then underneath, and this was a question earlier, are the other support staff. There's a per pupil amount that we provide every student. So every attending student using the average counts will receive $50 for a substitute. So the EPS formula will provide about, but in this case, for elementary students at 1600, we're giving about 81,000 per substitutes towards, towards funding. How you use it is up to you. That's what the funding level is. Supplies and equipment are included here. And these numbers, by the way, are also increased every year according to inflation. Not the real, not, not the inflation, the inflation factor that's in the formula, just so you know. Um, that's what's used. And then also if there's a, a change to it based on research and statute, then it would be changed. But these are these, that's what these numbers are. 
And so this one, a lot of people are like, well, we, EPS doesn't fund for co and extracurricular, but it does. Here on this page, it allows for $46 elementary per student and 140 secondary per student. Yes. Um, for benefits, mm -hmm. the computation of benefits appears to go off of actual staff numbers as opposed to EPS staff numbers. Is that correct? For example, teacher guidance. Oh, is uh, six? Oh, no, no, that's the addition of all these. Never mind. Okay. I, I didn't think mind. so, but I was going to have to. The answer is no. That's okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that's a formal. So, no, absolutely not. Yes. <laughs> so. That's, so if we add these, there we go. Yeah, it's it's. Do you see what we're using on the screen? No, I highlighted it. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, so for for the elementary, we add these four lines because this is the teacher's guidance, librarians, and help. So from the elementary portion of what the EPS funding formula is funding, not the actual salary. Okay. So then uh, regional adjustment, you all love regional adjustments. I'm sure you do. Because we're using an average salary matrix for the entire state for funding, there are some areas that it costs more, some areas that it costs less. In FY6, the determination of the one um, average was uh, put in place using regional index, a regional index from, oh, help me, Ida. Labor markets, labor market, regional index. And they were put, put in, one was Rockland. So if you cost more than Rockland, we're gonna give you a little more funding here if you get a, above one for original adjustment. If you cost less than Rockland at the time, you'll get a little less and you get below one for the regional adjustment to allow for the fact that we're using the same average so that we can distribute the funding a little more appropriately. The bad news is that those labor market areas have not been updated since FY6. And I'm pretty sure Rockland wouldn't be one now. And some of you are probably higher than whatever one is. And some of you are probably lower than whatever one is. This is a very touchy subject. And the reason it's not up to date is because there's gonna be winners and losers. Nobody wants to lose. When it gets updated, things are gonna shift. The money's gonna shift from one area to another and nobody's gonna be happy about that except the ones that get it. So we're trying to figure out how do we make this work to get it up to date and then keep it up to date without hurting too many. We're working on that right now, figuring that out. In the meantime, this is what we use. The regional just the indexes that we are using are from 2006. But you must have gone through that in 2006 because it was something else before then, right? So in 2006 is when essential programs and services was put into effect. Uh, Before that, it was a different funding formula. Gotcha. And it didn't have a regional adjustment. But, I'm aware. but still, if the formula changes, then there's going to be winners and losers. And Absolutely. Every time. But it's hard to put something like that through legislation. Yeah. Um, and so, but personally, I think we got to do it and then move on. Just because I think it's not, it's not, it's not right now. It's, it's not correct. I mean, the formula isn't perfect, but I think it does a pretty good job, but it has to stay up to date in order to do its job to be equitable. My personal opinion, which I have shared with the commission. <laughs> All right, um, so regional index adjustment, and then the EPS rate is determined by adding up all of those numbers on the right side. And I lost my clicker. All of those numbers on the right side um, and then dividing by the number of attendings, the average number of attending students, elementary and secondary. And that is your EPS rate, the multiplier for page two, where we allocate funding based on your subsidizable 
students, the ones that you are fiscally responsible for educating. Anybody have any questions on page one? Yes. So section D, those numbers are set. Those are not pulled from what we put into the EO. Correct. Right? These are set per pupil amounts in the book in statute. Mm -hmm. They are updated each year by an inflation factor and sometimes adjusted based on research that says they need to be changed. But that's the statute. Uh, every, well, the whole thing is in statute, as you know. In order to get anything, I mean, we, we have to get the calculation done and prepared in mid-December. I, I haven't said that part yet. Why do we have such an early freeze date and close date, and due date? Because by December 1st, I'm already being asked, hey, what's the funding level? What do, what's the mill rate? Well, I can't determine a funding level or a mill rate until I've calculated every district's formula. So and we're already, already being asked for that. Actually, they want it in September, the budget office for the state, so they can start their budget plan. They know we can't do it till after the collection of the data. But by December 1st, they're like, okay, where is it? And so, so it's a it's a struggle, but our team does the best we can for you, honestly. We, we don't want you to have errors. We don't want you to have mistakes. We want you to get what the formula is supposed to be allocating to you. Okay, anything else on page one? All right, we're going to move to page two. Donna, do you want to do any of the talking? No, you're good. Okay. <laughs> You're good at clicking. All right, so page two, I've given you a little bit to do. Page two, we're gonna we're gonna learn how to uh, figure out your disadvantage percentage. How many are excited about that? Nobody. Okay. So, but let's start at the top. These are our subsidizable students. So the data sheet that you have in front of you should have the October twenty twenty three subsidy students. For each of the three categories, pre-K is separate, K to eight, and then nine to 12. Those are the three that go into those top lines. And when you add them together, they should equal 2,333. Everybody know where to find these? Anybody need help? People online doing okay with what we sent them? And of course they can cheat, they can move the... Uh... <laughs> All right. All right, let's go ahead and reveal our numbers. So the pre-K should be twenty-seven. K eight should be one thousand five hundred and sixty-three. Nine twelve should be seven hundred and forty-three. I'd like you to note that these are different than the page one numbers. Uh, there's only 625, I mean, excuse me, for October 23, 1,586 attending, but there's only 1,563 substitute uh, subsidy. Why is that? Who can tell me? Why are there more subsidy and less attending? Or did I say that wrong? More attending and less subsidy. It's more attending the school, but less subsidy students. Right, and they're being paid by tuition. Exactly. So there's more attending. They aren't getting subsidy for them because they're getting tuition for them. But the district that they live in gets the subsidy for them so they can pay the tuition to who's providing the service. Okay? The caveat for that is the superintendent's agreement. If there's a superintendent's agreement, which ha would have to be done each year, where the superintendent of the sending SAU agrees and the superintendent of the receiving SAU agrees, they both have to agree that the student can, can, be, a sub, can be a superintendent agreement transfer. The subsidy also follows that student. And so they do get subsidy count for that student. No tuition is paid in that case. Everybody understand that? Okay. So, let 
Let's see if we can figure out this basic count calculation. 3K, we have 27 pupils. Oh wait, 27 pupils. But K to eight have averages. Oh, that's right. Pre-K uses the most recent October count only, not an average. But K to, K to 12 uses the average of the last two Octobers. It's fun to remember that when you're doing your calculations. Okay, that's fun. Why is that? Thanks. There's no good answer for that. <laughs> it's the way the law is written. <laughs> well, yes, we add estimates, but that's not why it's only the most recent October. It's just the way the law was written. Um, when they when they added pre-K to the funding formula, it was put in that it was just using the most recent October. Um, but yes, if you have a approved and approved new or expanding 3K classroom. This is where estimates can be used for that first year. Otherwise, these numbers are actuals from the prior year because we have to start calculating now for FY26 and we aren't gonna know what your FY26 numbers are. So we have to use the prior year. So for FY26, we'll be using FY23 and FY20, wait, <laughs> sorry. For FY26 next year, we'll be using the FY24 count from last October and the current upcoming October 1 count this year, those two years. Except for pre-K, which we only use the upcoming actual. Unless you have an estimate count available, through an approved pre-K program, through the early learning team at the department, you have to go through steps, then you will have estimate counts. However, yeah. if come October of next year, you said you're gonna have 20 pre-K, we added 20 to your already actual, and you only had an additional 10 next October, we will remove the funding for that additional 10. So we check the counts, for your estimates, fix it either up or down next year when the counts come in. Everybody good with that? Yeah. That's the only one we do it for though. Pre-K is the only one that has estimates and it's the only one that we correct in, in that year. The others use actuals from the prior two years. Oh, yes. Thank you for that. So here's here's a little tidbit of um, trivia. The pre the um, essential program services was never designed to include funding. OK, so we're going to do uh, the next presentation. This is going to be um, a presentation from myself and Maria. We'll do half and half. And today we're going to talk about the MEF system sometimes referred to as Neo Financial. And again, Maria and I both will be presenting this particular presentation. So the main education financial system is the system that SAUs use to report all of their financial data to the department uh, special, I think it's not special teams. We are special, but the finance team. Um, if you do not have a, a NEO permission, you can click into the electronic request for access form. The superintendent must complete this form requesting permissions to get into MEFs. Excuse me. You want me to go? If you would, yes, go ahead and click into that. And this is exactly where your superintendent will fill out the information for the request for NEO. So I wanted to show you that link. Um, it takes about 24 hours for the MEFs permission to actually process because there's a couple of steps in between. Whereas typically when you get a NEO permission, it's immediate. MEFs does take a little bit of time um, to process. Just That's the same form that you, if you want access to the student data that we talked about earlier and the staff data, it's the same form. Um, 
and your superintendent needs to send it to the support, uh, Madam support team, and then they can get you set up. And the MEFS one just takes a little longer because it's an extra step. Yes. Are we also getting digital copies of the color? Yes, yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> Everybody that's registered, you'll get one in your email. Oh, and I didn't mention um, CEUs. CEUs. I meant to say we are providing CEUs today for training if you're so there'll be certificates coming later. Later this week. Automatically an email? Automatically an email, correct. Okay, so it does take about 24 hours for your your access to process. So today um, we're gonna talk about what you need to do in maps, right? So I have indicated a link here for the quarterly required reporting, which is on our website, if you could click into that. I'll tell you right up front, our website does need to be updated. Um, you may or may not know, we are finally fully staffed after two, over, probably over two years. Mm -hmm. um, so even though I'm gonna show you this page, there are things on there that, there's things that aren't on there that should be on there. And um, so what I wanna mention is, this particular page pretty much only talks about quarter fours for your for your actual reports. But in reality, we need all of your quarters. So um, quarter one through four should be uploaded in the time frame 30 days after the quarter ends. You should upload your quarterly report according to that particular quarter. Um, I'm gonna take this over here for a second so I can see a little better. So you need actual revenue, actual actual expenditure, and actual balance sheet. Um, one of the things that we've talked about recently is what funds are necessary to upload to us. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and 6,000 are uh, the ones that we are requiring you to upload. If you are using Fund 9,000 for a special education regional program, we would want that uploaded as well. If you're using 9,000 for your student activities, we don't need to see those. There's a spot in your system that you can actually check mark to exclude from reporting. Uh, so be aware that the funds that we're looking for aren't necessarily every fund that you use. Um, so this page will be updated to show all of the quarters in the near future. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is the getting started guide for maps. You can click into that if you want to follow. This is in your pamphlet. And um, so I won't talk too much about it, but if you wanted an online version, it's here available for you through that link. Okay, cool. Another thing you'll need to do is submit electronic transfer of specifically coded budget revenue and expenditure file records from your accounting system to MAPS. This is due 30 days after the budget passes or by August 15th. You also need to upload <laughs> budget backup documentation for MAPS. Uh, that also is due 30 days after budget passes or by August 15th. The BFM 46 is also budget related. It's a budget assessment report. If your district consists of more than one town, you are required to fill this out uh, due 30 days after budget passes or by August 15th. You'll also need to submit quarterly electronic transfer of specifically coded actual revenue, actual expenditure, and actual balance sheet file records from your accounting system to us within 30 days after the quarter ends. Once the annual audit is complete, it may be necessary for you to upload a new quarter four if audit adjustments were made uh, to accounts previously reported in quarter four. This one's kind of important because we ask for your data real quick. Like we want your data, we need something in there so that calculations can start. But the reality is that your audit may not come until November or December. And if there are audit adjustments, then the data that we have does not actually reflect what your data is. So we ask that you do a another quarter for an upload after you make your adjustments from your audit. Next slide, 
It wasn't obeying my arrow. So what do we do when we get your data? We validate it, right? We use that data for many different purposes. Uh, budget files, I use your budget backup, which are your mark articles, um, your budget meeting minutes uh, to validate what we're seeing in your budget files. The EFM 46 is validated using those budget documents as well. Uh, and then the actual revenue and expenditure files with the new records are validated using the county handbook and the business rules engine within MAPS to determine whether the coding uh, are, are allowable together, the string is allowable. So that's what we do when we get your data and how we validate the information that you give to us. Okay, uploading files. Uh, there's a link here that says upload file format instructions. Uh, it's just uh, an example of probably what most everyone knows. I think most of these are already formatted in your accounting systems. Um, so typically I don't think you have to necessarily worry about the format after you build your template in your system. Um, file folders names, very specific mess, very specific about naming conventions. Um, so make sure you're in a, make sure it's a text file and make sure the name is um, correct. Now uploading files, this you can find in the financial submission tab, file uploads, and it's basically drag and drop or select from your computer. Very, very easy format, submit. Once you submit, the system's gonna tell you if it was submitted successfully or whether it has failed um, or not been successfully submitted. Uploading. Next slide, please. And this is where you would upload your budget backup documentation. You would go to the financial permission, financial data permission. And then there's a document up upload tab. That's where you would upload your backup documentation. And it's uh, three fields, required fields, and then upload. It's quite simple. I don't mind getting the email, but I don't mind them being loaded with the mess either. Honestly, if you email them me, I see them sooner. <laughs> That's how that works. <laughs> Next slide. So when, when you load your budget backup documentation, it's gonna go to the supplementary documents section. So you have your submission section that shows all the files that you have submitted. And below that is the supplementary documents. Those files will land there and I will go in and retrieve them. Once I retrieve the, fu the files, I actually delete them. Um, hasn't been a problem yet, I don't think, but um, I've had to ask for more or anything, but that's what, um, that's where you'll, you'll see them. So, next slide, please. Checking the status of your uploads um, in the financial data submission page, you will see a list of your files that you have uploaded. What I'd like to mention today is statuses. So this is typically what happens is you begin the process of your upload. It's probably in draft format. Okay. <laughs> then you submit your file. Once it has successfully reached us, it automatically goes into pending status or it goes to failed status. If it goes to failed status, somebody's smiling up there. <laughs> Come on, who has not a failed status? <laughs> so if it goes to failed status, it means that the mess business engine rules have identified something that doesn't combine nicely. Part of your string is not compatible. So hopefully it goes right to pending. So from pending, I'm gonna skip over a few for a minute, but from pending, that's when it comes to us. And that's when we start looking at it. We're either gonna approve it or we're gonna reject it. Um, all of these, maybe not the draft, but all of the other um, statuses generate an email to you. So you know when a file's been approved, you know when a file's been uh, failed, you should have, um, the status through an email. So if everything looks good, we're gonna approve your files. 
If it doesn't, we're going to reject it. If we reject a file, typically there's a, a, a little, I think there's 200 characters for us to write what the problem is. It's not always easy to do. I tend to go to my email and send you an email and just say, please see email from Denise. Um, because um, sometimes it needs more than 200 characters to explain what's, what's going on. So if, if it's rejected, then we ask that you, you know, fix it and re-upload it. Now we're going to approve it because it's right. So we've approved it. The next step for you is to complete it right here, complete. You have to go back into the system. I'm not sure if the word is completed or sign off in your section. We don't have that page, so it's, I don't know. Um, and once you complete that, you're telling us everything is good. Well, you know, everything's great. And then it goes into migrated status. And the important piece for migration is that until your files are migrated, we don't consider them complete. Um, and the reason why is because files get migrated and then we can pull the data from the back end until if they're not migrated, that information is not in the database um, for us to use. So very important to migrate your files. Um, there is a spot, I'll go into the next page, I'm sorry. Um, right, yeah, blocked files. Blocked files uh, occur because within MAPS, there are dates for each of the quarters. So if you're uploading a quarter that was four months ago, the system's gonna block your file. Um, and that's just so that if there's, maybe you thought you uploaded a quarter two, but you actually uploaded it as a quarter three, MEPS is saying, wait a minute, it's not time for that yet, I'm gonna block you. It's really just a safety mechanism, I think, so that if you accidentally put it under a wrong quarter, that um, we wouldn't approve it as that quarter, that it would be a, a way to just make sure that that's what you're uploading. If you're late on your files, which happens, that's when you see more of the block files is when you're trying to do them and get caught up and you're late on them. But if a block file comes through, you get an email, it says to make contact with the state. Um, I'm gonna say it's gonna be Maria who's gonna be unblocking your files because she's gonna be doing the reviewing of the files. But certainly myself, don't hesitate if you have a block file and you need it unblocked. Um, next page, please. Okay, code combination validation list. A lot of people ask, how do I check codes? How do I know what codes are good with other codes? Um, I personally think it's a loaded question. Uh, there's so many codes. And when you're talking about five pieces of a string to make sure each piece works well with each other, it's sometimes difficult. This is my go-to code combination validation. You can choose two types of your string and see if they work together. So in this case, I said, can I use function 1000, which is instruction, with object code 5400, which is uh, ad, uh, advertisement? So to me, the answer should be no, right? Mm -hmm. So I put that in the system and, and uh, it came back and it said, function 1000 with object code 5400, is there an exclusion rule? Yes. Y means yes. So it's saying it's excluded. You cannot use instructional function with advertisement object code. So here is, if there's a Y in the exclusion rule column, it means it's excluded. <laughs> I didn't fall. <laughs> Thank you. Know, that state of Maine, I thought it was a stumbling block. <laughs> And I moved it there. <laughs> if you see an N, it means it's not excluded, and you can use that combination together. If no results appear, assume that you can use the combination. We are working very hard to try to, um, we're not building it, but to, to really think about what your needs are with these code combinations. We know the system isn't as friendly with that, but please know that we don't think it's friendly with that either. So we're gonna try real hard to get something in place that's helpful and, and that you can build a string and know, feel good about it. So, 
next time. Oh, sorry, I had a, just a couple questions. Okay. I apologize. So this is uh, the validation list. If I need to create, or if I need to create a new line, I'm going to come here first to make sure that when I create that line, it won't result in an error later. Correct. And a quick question on the upload: um, the status of migrated. Is that something that we do? So we it's completed, or is that something you? So do? as soon as you complete your file, yeah. you go back in and sign it. It automatically goes to migrate. Oh, okay. So your last step is completing that, and then it'll flow right to migration. Okay. Thank you. Salary and benefit matrix. Probably everyone has seen this to everybody all the time. Probably duplicates. <laughs> uh, there is a link there. We don't necessarily need to go into the link, but it's there if you want the electronic version. Salary and benefit coding must be exactly the same, except for the object code. Um, a cost center code difference will it, it it will reject. It has to be the exact same string, except for the object code. And basically. This great ben, uh, benefit, salary benefit matrix gives you the salary code, and then it literally gives you all of the benefit codes that go with it. So as long as you're paying attention to this, when you're setting up your salary and benefit codes, you should be fine. But again, you still need those other numbers to be exact. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. So any <laughs> questions on the part that I presented? Okay, so Maria is going to come up and do the last part of the presentation, and then she's going to hand it back to me for the very last slide. Um, but I do want you to know that Maria has done a great job, and I don't know if any of you have seen some things go through yet, but she's really paying attention to the handbook. So please have patience, um, because if it says in the handbook you use only 1,000 for the function code, she's going to call you out. Even though we have found that there are times where things are acceptable, She's new and she's using the handbook as her guide. So just have a little patience. Um, we really are trying to update um, our handbook and get um, as much, uh, as much, uh, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. We want you to get more for your, more bang for your buck, how's that? Okay, and now you get to talk with Maria. I'm going to make this quick because lunch is ready, so I'm not accepting questions. Thank you. So the main school finance coding, um, the financial data is formatted as a string of codes according to the coding handbook, and you can access the electronic copy of the handbook here, <laughs> there. So um, I recommend getting to know the handbook, print a copy, so uh, you can make notes if and when there are updates. Um, and use the control F feature to search for keywords or codes. Um, review prior coding updates. And we provided a link over there. Um, here, uh, we're gonna be posting the updated, um, the, the, update, the updated updates. Like you can see the uh, discontinued codes and new codes in here. Uh, the one in there is from last fiscal year, the 20, the 24. So we'll be posting the 24, 25 soon. <laughs> um, the accounting strain. Can you go back? Go back. Go back to yes. Oh. Oh, wait a minute, there's still more. <laughs> Sorry. Um, review the uh, chart of accounts uh, based on what you're looking for. Um, so if you're looking, if you're searching for a model, a model, model coding, coding there's my accent. <laughs> um, if you're searching for model coding strings, uh, just choose what, 
which one is best. Uh, like for instance, you're looking for transportation, you can just click the uh, transportation. Transportation. That's at the bottom. Yeah, Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. And then you can see. It's a little slow. Yeah. <laughs> Press us it downloads and then you can look at the Excel. Oh, yeah, so um Get on the so, screen and you gotta drag it over. The Excel will open up. <laughs> how, do I, how do I drag it over? Oh shit. <laughs> Told you technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, so you can choose the one that you're most uh, comfortable with. Like It's very hard to see it from that angle. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're looking for the uh, transportation, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for the aid salary, um, and you want to scroll down supplies, <coughs> it has all the five the fund, the program, the function, the object, and the cost center in there. So just choose what's what you think is best for you. What are you looking for? Person you're searching for. Um We'll get to it. And that chart of accounts is everything. I mean, not everything, but it has the special ed in there. You're looking for extracurricular. Just, is that where you were? Yes. Um, yeah, I got none not yet. No. Go back. I'm not. So, accounting string should tell a story. A fund is the revenue source. Who is paying for the expenditure? The program, what program is benefiting from the expenditure? The function, what is the purpose of the expenditure? And the objects, specifically, what is the expenditure? The cost center code for which school building location is the expenditure for? Um, next slide, please. So um, this is just a summary of the expenditure components. And we have the fund. Um, like I've talked on the previous slide, uh, the programs, the function, object, and cost center. Uh, if you want to see the detailed version, just check the electronic copy of the handbook, which I also, uh, there's a link there, handbook. handbook codes. It will take you there. Yeah. And it will give you the handbook. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so like it includes uh, the five components, I'm still on the. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I went ahead. I'm not a very good clicker. You're good. I'm um, just hungry. Yeah, with this has details such as numbers and descriptions. For example, the fund 2000 series are for special revenue. Uh, and the 3000 series under program represents CTEs and so on. Next slide, please. So on this uh, page, you'll see a summary also for the revenue and balance sheets components. For revenue, the codes are a combination of fund and revenue. And uh, for the balance sheets, they're a combination of fund and the balance sheet. So the next slide contains some important reminders to keep in mind. Um, 
One of the tools main school administrative units used to ensure they receive sufficient funding is the financial accounting for local school system in May. And it's another link there for the electronic copy of the handbook. Uh, using codes appropriately at the local level is very important. State and federal level reports are driven by the data provided to MAPS. Um, your hard work providing good data enables the, us, uh, the DOE, to use the best method possible in efficiently allocating support to districts. So um, we provided our contact there. If you have questions for MAPS and coding, that's me. Uh, budget and coding, that's Denise. And uh, I'm the... <laughs> For help. Uh, I'm going to uh, give the lies, last slides of Denise. Oh, oh questions? No. Oh, yeah. So the last slide, um, there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. I don't really want the answers like right now necessarily, maybe an email. How do you account for your main care revenue and your main care seed? And the reason we're asking this is because um, I know last year when I reviewed the actual actuals, quarter fours, um, I found that about 50% of the SAUs were not accounting for their main care seed uh, correctly, which in turn made it so that they weren't accounting for their subsidy because your subsidy pays for your main care seed. So even though you don't see it, you still have to account for that as subsidy that was allocated to you. So the question is, is what steps do you take? Okay, I know you provide this service. You obviously pay the person if you're doing public. Um, you pay the person from your general fund, I would assume. And then when the main care revenue comes in, what do you do then when that main care revenue comes in? How do you make your books balance? How do you make them right? We're on the other side, we don't have the depth of your books. Um, so that's why we're putting this question out. What are the steps that you take? We recently had someone say, you know, I think there's a better way to clarify that instructions, the instructions for main care seed. And so we are looking at that right now. And that's probably the biggest reason that generated this question is because we know folks don't, and not everybody does it the same way. So I don't wanna tell you you have to do it as, this way when your way may be perfectly fine um, and the other districts might be fine as well. So really, if you have a moment, if you could shoot me an email and let me know how do you account for not only your main care seed, but, but for the revenue when it comes in after providing a service. And then the other question is how do you code instructional supplies? And this came up because of a actually a rejection. Somebody, somebody's file was rejected because they showed um, a different function. It wasn't function 1000 with object code 6100, which we know 6100 is instructional supplies. So when you see a different function, automatically it's like, well, why aren't they using instruction? Maybe there's a good reason you're not using instruction. I don't know because I don't work in the, in the, in the weeds like you guys do. So how do you code your instructional supplies? And if they are different than 1,600, kind of like just, Give me an example of why. I'm not saying it's wrong necessarily, but help us understand a little bit better. If anybody's willing to do that, we would appreciate it. So right now, what the handbook says about first 6100 is if you're doing instructional supplies, the function should be 1000. And we've had some challenges. And so we want to update the fund, the, the handbook, to, re to reflect what's actually being done. There are some limitations. We do follow the federal handbook as a model because we report everything to the feds. But if there's a way that we can make it easier and it's more reflective of what you're doing, that's why we're putting out these questions. So we sort of want to know, like, what are you putting in instructional supplies? And not, when would you change that function from 1000 to something else, okay? Um, so we're open. We want to make sure we make a change that reflects is reflective of what you're doing, and is also not going to kill you in the sense of a cleanup. Mm -hmm. Nothing would change until FY26, but we're trying to solicit this information now, and we want your input. And we may eventually have more questions like that.
because we are trying to do some cleanup so <clears throat> and some updating. So thank you. Um, Okay, so um, section four, this is where we figure out if you're in a combined district, this is where we determine how much each member town is responsible for in the total cost of education that was calculated for the formula. So the prior three pages, page one, two, and three of your ED279 was to get to a point where, okay, we've determined this is what EPS says you're going to need as a district for the essential programs and services to cover the students you have and the needs that they have, the basic adequate model to allow for every student in your district to achieve the main learning results. That's what we've, that's what we've determined. This is the cost. You might need more because we're not telling you how to spend it or what to spend it on. You likely need more than, than what EPS says. And we have a report that shows all the districts and whether or not they're budgeting over or under the EPS calculation. It's a pretty fun report. We can show you where that is later. Fun report. It's a spreadsheet. So um, this is really an important area. And, and I'm just going to, I'm going to talk through this slide and I, I don't know. I don't remember if I put it in here or not. I probably did because it's my favorite slide. Too bad I can't make my own thing work. I did it for others. End of day. All right, I'm doing something wrong. Sorry. I think I have too many open is my problem. I need to close some presentations. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. So real quick, I'm just gonna kind of look through this. Um, and I didn't put it in here, I, I will. Um, EPS is a formula that is intended to provide adequate funding to allow all students to achieve the main learning results. Adequate funding, adequate education. We all hope that your, your local schools want to provide better than that education. But there's two parts to the formula. The first part is what's the cost of, of that adequate education? That's the first three pages that we just talked about. And then the second part is, okay, now that we have the total cost, how do we distribute the limited funds that the state has to the towns in an equitable manner? So this is showing the difference between equality and equity. We're not trying to do an e equal distribution, we're doing an equitable distribution. And the reason, I'm gonna try that. The reason is that not all towns in Maine, is it still working if I'm up here like this? Okay. The reason is that not all towns in Maine have the ability with their local tax base to provide the same funding for education as others. So the limited state funds, we want to make sure, go to those that may need it more. So if you look at this and you think of these different, differently uh, vertically challenged or differently heighted, <laughs> What is the word? <laughs> Differently yeah. height people, different height people. These are the towns, okay? These are the towns and their tax base. 
Some have a, have a bigger tax base than others. And so their students can actually reach the apple or achieve that education level easier than other towns. So if this is the state funding these boxes and state gave every town or every student the exact same amount, there is still a couple of us, and I put myself in that category because I'm only five feet, um, that would not be able to reach the apple. The towns would not be able to provide as good an education. And so the state funding, it then looks at and says, okay, if this town can already provide the funding needed that we've just at calculated the cost with their tax base, their local tax base, then they don't really need any of the state money. And we can give that to other towns that need more of it so that all students are on a level playing field to start. So that being said, that's where the distribution comes in. That's why some towns are a minimum receiver or contributor. Other towns are 50% receiver. Other towns are 80% receiver. It all depends on their, their local property tax base, which is based on the main revenue service town valuation. So section four of the 8279 report is going to show how this um, distribution is done. This one, okay, okay, sorry. So it takes the total allocation from the previous three pages and then for fiscal capacity, ability con to contribute, the local town's ability to contribute towards the cost of education as calculated in the EPS formula. Okay, that's what this is, ability to contribute. We look at either the three, the average of the three most recent town valuations, which we get from main revenue service, or the most recent, whichever is less. And right now, most towns are having valuations that are increasing significantly. Last year, the state average increase was 8%. Um, that's the average. <laughs> So what that does, by using a three-year average or most recent, if you're going through increases in town valuation, it allows a bit of a buffer to what you're able to contribute toward education. However, if your most recent is less, then it allows you to use that lesser because you're going to have less opportunity to contribute through your property tax base. So that is one way of a buffer that we, that we use. The state share is calculated after we do the cost, we subtract the required local, and that's the state share. So section four, this one is an example of a four town district. And again, I chose this one on purpose. Um, the way that we distribute the, the allocation, the, the responsibility of the cost. The cost, uh, I, I don't have that on the slide, sorry, is we look at percentage of students that live in those towns. So it's the average subsidy count from October, the last two Octobers, of the only the students, the subsidy students that live in each of these towns. And what is the percentage of the total students, subsidy students? And so each town is responsible for part of that uh, education calculation based on their percentage of students. Then, I guess that is that slide. And this isn't working yet. I'll just it. Um, is recalculated, comes in. So, The, total, the percentage that we've, just, we've determined is then, I know why I'm struggling. This is your, these are your slides. You just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder. Oh, uh, this is your presentation. <laughs> Donna will now take over. <laughs> <laughs> this does not seem to me. It does, but it doesn't. 
<laughs> so unlike Ida, I actually did the math for you. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the amount that each municipality or town is responsible for is their percentage of students multiplied by the total allocation and multiplied by the municipal debt, state approved debt. And those two numbers added together give you the amount that that town is responsible for. So for Bowdoin, they have 19.59% of the students that's multiplied by the total total cost, also multiplied by the total debt that that um, R two seventy five has, and those two numbers are added together to give you Bowdoin's um, total um, allocation requirement. So that's part 4A. So 4B looks at the valuation, which follows the claim very nicely. <laughs> and this shows you what we look at. We look at the, the most recent, which is 2023. And then we also look at the three year average between 23, 22, and 21. And we use the lesser of those. So for Bowdoin, it was the three year average that was less. So that is their valuation. Then we take that valuation that we determine either the three-year average or the most recent, and we multiply that by the EPS mill rate. That is not your tax town, your town tax mill rate, it's a special EPS mill rate. So their three-year average state valuation times the mill rate is what they are able to contribute towards the cost of education. And what does the mill rate represent? You told me you would answer that part. <laughs> the, the cap. It's the most any town will be asked to contribute toward education for 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 EPS anyway. So the state this to it in order to receive the state funds. It's the cap. No town will be asked to contribute any more than 6.62 mills of their valuation in this given year. The mill rate changes every year. The mill rate is determined after we've calculated the 8279 numbers for every SAU. And then we look at the total cost of education, which is right now 2.4 billion for the cost of education in the entire state. The state covers 55% of the total cost, not 55% of individual SAU cost, 55% of the total cost of 2.4 billion is 1.4 billion, something. I've got those numbers. <laughs> so the state is covering 1.4 billion, that leaves another 1 billion left for the locals to cover. So we say, okay, if we still have to come up with 1 billion, we look at the valuations of all the towns that we're gonna to be using in the EPS formula and say, okay, what is the lowest amount that we can set the mill rate at, the cap, in order to be able to uh, have the locals contribute that 1.0 billion. That is, their, that is the local share after the state has contributed their 55%. Does that make sense? Okay. Back to you. Speaking. Go to the next one. So now that we have uh, 4A, which is the town's um, allocation distribution, and then we have 4B, which is their ability to contribute, we can now go to 4C and take their valuation. And we're going to take EPS allocation that they're responsible for is at 7.4, but their ability to pay or to contribute is only 1.9. So they cannot pay all of that 7.4. So that's where the state steps in and says, okay, we will make up the rest of that 7.4 and the state share for voting is 5.5. So but remember, we would never ask anybody to pay more than the 6.62 mills. So they are capped at what they're able to contribute, the 1.9, even though their 
their town is responsible for 7.4. So the state is the difference. Can we point out the one that is below the number? Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> so how do we determine if you're a minimum contributor, payer, receiver? We look at that valuation, which is in the, um, their responsibility for Parkswell is 5.484. And then we looked at their valuation. And that's based on percentage of students, remember? Yes, 4A percentage of students is their, what they're responsible for. The main revenue service for your average said that they could actually pay 2.1 million. Well, that's their valuation. Valuation, I'm sorry. So you multiply their valuation times um, what their, mm -hmm. the mill rate to get their, what they are able to pay. So that's the 14 million three, which is much higher than the 5.4 that they are actually required. So their their cap is actually 4A and not 4B because they are not asked to pay more than the cap, but they're also not asked to pay more than what they are responsible for based on the percent of students. So the reason we say that they're a minimum payer or contributor is because their mill rate actually is much lower than that EPS mill rate of 6.62. They only have a mill rate of 2.54. And that is found by dividing what they're required, what their allocation required by their evaluation into the 2.54. So that's why we have some that are minimum contributors is because their ability to pay based on their tax base is more than what they're actually responsible for. Oops, that's it. that was it? Okay, um, I'm gonna add a little bit to that. Make sure we answer the question of how do we determine if we're a minimum payer or minimum contributor? Anyone? Sorry. Um, so basically, if you're contributing all that you need to and, the, and you don't need the state funding, you're getting zero state share at this point, zero state contribution, but, but everybody gets something. So minimum contributors receive a minimum contributor adjustment. It used to be called the minimum receiver adjustment, but I actually prefer the term contributor because that's what's in statute. It's the local required contribution and their contribution is not at the cap like all the other towns. And so they technically don't need the state funding, but everybody gets something. So there are adjustments for these minimum contributors. And so many contributors get, they all get something. Either there are options, there's either the minimum, minimum, minimum adjustment, minimum, minimum, which is 5% of the total cost, I believe, total allocation that was calculated. Or there's one that's 50% of your special education allocation, which can be significant for many districts. Um, there's also economic disadvantaged. If your economic disadvantage percentage is higher than the state average economic disadvantage percentage, you get an adjustment for that if you're a minimum contributor. Uh, and the way that you know if you're getting these adjustments is on section five of your 8279, which brings us to the last bit of this part, which I was am supposed to do. <laughs> I can't believe you just let me do that. <laughs> so going back to your fancy dancy spreadsheets, where, oh look, you want to come and do the? Oh, sorry. Okay. So I'm going to help you figure out how we do this calculation. So page four of your big Excel spreadsheet. 
we've got some open lines. You can look at her slides. Yeah, she gave you the answers. Um, but I, I just want to show you how it's done. We won't spend too much time because because we're well, we're actually we're doing all right. Um, so basically, as as I said before, your average subsidizable students that comes from the student data. So we've got that in your student data sheet if you want to look it up. But we will give it to you. Uh, the one that was missing, four hundred fourteen. That's the four. So these are the residents of that town. We then take that and determine the percentage of the total students, which is 2,345. And so you can see there each of the percentages for each of the member towns that they would be accountable for in the cost. Obviously, Topsum, with the most students, is asked to be accountable for the most of the cost of education. It just seems right, right? So then, we take that percentage times the total cost at the bottom is 34.4 million. So we've added in all the special ed costs and we're up to 34 million. They also have a state approved debt service, construction, school construction at 3.8 million. We keep those separate because debt always has to be paid before subsidy. And if you don't have enough subsidy to cover debt, then you technically don't get subsidy, you just get debt to be paid because the debt has to be paid before subsidy. So if they didn't have enough of a allocation of subsidy to cover the debt, then all the money they get from the state would have to go towards that debt and they wouldn't necessarily get anything for funding. Those are usually the little ones. Uh, Shabiga Island actually is usually in that situation. So it's, uh, it's not common, but it, it is an occurrence. Um, so again, it's the percentage of students to determine how much each town is uh, going to be responsible for in the cost of the district. Now, if you're a one town district, it's 100%. That's pretty easy to figure out. So then, yeah, go ahead and just, just show them all. Show them all. I'm not going to make you look it up, but you get the idea. We, we, so we've got the three-year average or the most recent, whichever is less, of evaluation. To do that calculation, it is 6.62 .6 divided by 1,000 times the valuation, and that gives you the amount that they are able to contribute in this year. The most that they will be asked to contribute is that amount times the mill rate. So then we compare it as Donna explained to what we to what they're responsible for. And as you can see, Harps Well is able to cover more than what they're accountable for based on the valuation. So that puts them down at 2.54 mill rate, but it also puts the state share here at zero. So here it looks like Harpswell doesn't contribute, doesn't get anything from the state. However, they're all part of Topsum, uh, SAD 55, 75. And so, you know, they're all one unit. And if you go to page five, you will see that they do in fact get an adjustment. And I've also included how that adjustment is calculated. Um, so they are eligible for what is called a debt service adjustment. So because they have debt service that is state funded, they are eligible for an adjustment based on that. So the state contributes $5,461 on behalf of Harpswell and it reduces their local contribution by that amount. Now, there are other districts that get a significant amount more. Harpswell just doesn't qualify for any of the other adjustments. But other towns, York is an example, they get about $2 million, even though they're a minimum contributor. They get about $2 million because they're eligible for the 50% special ed. So they still get a significant amount of state share, of state funding. The 
Um, information about state share and who's getting what and all that, it's all on our on our web. We, we provide spreadsheets with all of it so you can compare every district, every year, however you want to do. What district are you? Again? 15. Yeah, you're not a normal receiver, if I remember. But, so, our contributor, I need to train myself. Um, so, any questions about distribution or how it's determined? Yes. Main care seed payments. We love main care seed payments. <laughs> I can. I would love to to explain that with the help of my friends if I need it. Okay. Main care seed. If you bill main care, federal requirement is you have to pay a seed portion, a local seed portion. The LEA, local education agency. Thank you. I'm so bad at the last words. Um, is responsible for seed in order to get the federal money. And it's approximately 30%, 38%, excuse me, 38%. Well, um, a number of years ago, many of the uh, special purpose private schools were just not bothering to charge the seed portion and only building main care. So the feds were paying their part, but the locals weren't paying their part. The feds didn't like that. So they changed the rules and said, okay, state, you're responsible to make sure that the seed gets paid on behalf of the LEA. So the state has to actually pay it for you, the seed portion. And then what we do, because we've paid, paid one of you paid a bill for you, is we remove the amount that we paid from one of your from your subsidy allocation. You're still getting funding. It's still the subsidy you receive, but we paid a bill for you, so we're taking it back. But your funding did not reduce as a result. Your funding stayed the same, but we paid one of your bills. So we took some money out to recoup, recover the money that we paid that bill for. Yes? And you can see that on your E279 section five. And submitting, submitting that main care bill does reduce the amount that you pay for that service. So you're only paying on a seat. Right. So some people think it's not worth billing main care. I understand it's a lot of work, but it really is worth it to get the federal money. Does that answer the online question? Oh. Okay. All right, uh, we're right on time, look at that. Any other? All right, so uh, let's get started. Finally, and last and least of this. Um, thank you for bearing with us all day today. We appreciate that you guys all came out. Um, so annual audit review, it's not what anyone wants to talk about, but here we are. Um, so as you all know, state, uh, SAUs and municipalities are required to submit an audit every year. Um, those, uh, and if, if your if your total expenditures on your CFAR are over seven hundred and fifty thousand, you are required to uh, submit a single audit. If it is less than seven hundred and fifty thousand, it's a financial statement. Um, and as you all probably know. If you are a municipality school, you need to submit municipality and school audits. Um, it can be a combined audit, it can be individual, however, your school department, town manager, whoever, whatever, whatever they choose. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so all SAU audits are due on 1230. Um, municipal Municipal audits are due within six months of the end of the previous fiscal year. So I had some come in already this year. Their fiscal audit, their fiscal end of year was January 31st. I've already got their audits. Like it's been a little surprising, honestly. Um, 
just for an FYI, the superintendents are responsible for both municipality and the school department audits. So if like, obviously the municipality isn't his responsibility, but he is the point, he or she is the point person for the Department of Education and therefore it's his responsibility to make sure paperwork or whatever is being kept, kept up with. In other words, it's his response, his or her responsibility to make sure we get it. Or right. We get an extension request. Right. Not we'll get the there. We'll get there. Well, I had some confusing looks. Okay. <laughs> um. So. Next slide, please. Okay. So you've got your you've got your audit put sent in. Uh, the next step, uh, once it comes to the DOE audit email. The next step is that it's going to be reviewed and recorded. Um, if everything is a, if everything is approved, both the superintendent and you as the business manager will receive an audit decision review, an audit review decision email, um, and you're all set. Congratulations, you're done for that fiscal year. Move on to the next year. Um, if there are findings in your audit, which the auditors will send us the management letter. So if you send us the, the audit, please send your whole package because I can't, a lot of times the CIFA isn't even in that initial package. It's like on a side side uh, attachment. And so then I can't complete it and it's back and forth and whatever. Um, so if there are findings, if the, the audit will be reviewed, and then if there are findings, the findings will be reviewed for severity. Um, sometimes it's nothing. You've included a CAP response right in already to the auditor. Um, if that happens, we'll review both. If everything looks pretty good, you've got a plan moving forward. We are more than happy to just accept, sustain your finding, accept your CAP response, move on. Um, the, the one caveat to that would be if there's a federal finding, like they're usually numbered 2023-001 or whatever, those ones, I get them, but I forward them to the federal team that it pertains to because it's not my decision to decide whether or not they need more of a cap response from you. That's their decision. They handle those and then they send me their their request for how they want you guys to respond. If they're happy with the included, they'll say, no, nope, we're good. You'll get the decision email and you're done. Otherwise you'll get a cap response. Um, if, if nothing is included in the audit and the finding is significant, you'll get an email from me asking for a corrective action plan, which it's, seems scary. Like I get it <laughs> to get an email from the state saying, Hey, this was a finding. What are you, what are you going to do about it? So if you can go to the next slide, um, cap response, cap, uh, cap requests are really only under material weaknesses and significant deficiencies comments. The auditor might have 15 comments he or she or they don't necessarily account up to being significant enough to ask for a response for and it's not they don't consider it a finding so neither do we we list it we make a note of it just to keep an eye out for next year because next year it could become a significant deficiency um so and the other thing about it is if i if you receive a cap request, failing to respond to it can result in a subsidy hold. We don't it's, want to do that. We don't want to do that. It's in statute. That's the response. If we don't get a cap, re cap response, eventually, if we've asked for one, it is a subsidy hold. Yes. Yes, ma'am. If you are get a cap request, or if we get a cap request for in the municipal audit, what can we do about it? You shouldn't get a cap request for the municipal okay. because we understand and acknowledge that you the schools don't have any control over what the town does. Um, we might ask 
some more questions or something, but you shouldn't get a you shouldn't get a full out cap request from the town. Thank you. Can I just mention that we just went through a little scenario where it was a town finding, but it mm -hmm. mentioned the school in it. Yes. We had a long discussion about this because we're not sure where our line is there. Right. So that might be a time where we might ask more questions. Mm -hmm. But if it if the town specifies the school limit, we kind of have to pay more. Right. Thank you, Denise. Um next slide, please. So you've gotten your CAP request, what do you do now? So the first thing I would say is take note, there will always be a due date um, and the findings. The findings will always be, uh, the findings will always be bulleted to say, okay, this is what the auditor has really focused in on, wage rate requirements, child nutrition, whatever. Um, and so those a lot of times will give you the key points of what they want to see or what we want to see in the cap response if it's if it's accounting or accounts payable or whatever and the auditor has said in his management letter hey they don't keep their books at all and i had to account for everything at the end of the year you laugh but it has happened <laughs> it. right she laughs because it has happened and so it's like okay like don't one of those <laughs> so it's like okay so that you know maybe you should have some form of checks and balances or something or a plan to get checks and balances and sometimes so on that note we do take note that like, and even the auditors will take note, if you are a tiny municipality school that has two employees in the office, they understand that um, distribution of responsibilities, you're not gonna have, be able to have three people do five different things just for accountability. There's, and the auditors a lot of times will make a note of that and just say, this office is tiny. We understand this is a finding. They're not gonna change, but they do their best to make sure their, their checks and balances are in place. Um, so when you're sending us the cap, especially if it's something bigger, like it's a big thing, missing money, things like that, that the auditor has found, be as detailed as possible. I've had SAUs that will send a one-line response in their, in their audit response with the original package. Almost always it will get a request follow-up because it's like you spent two seconds getting a sentence and that was it. And that like, if it's a major finding, that's not good enough. And so uh, there are certain fed federal teams that are a lot more picky than others. Um, but pretty much all of them would say, hey, like, can you just be more detailed? Like, tell me your actual plan, not I'm going to fix it. Okay. <laughs> Bought a new calculator. We're good. <laughs> um, and last on this slide, just any corrective action plan, any of that, any questions, send it to the DOE audit email. Um, it does come to my inbox, and I believe Denise's and maybe somebody, one other person. I will be the one responding to it unless I'm out or whatever. But it's just that we keep all of we try to keep all of our audit stuff there, so that if there's ever a follow up or God forbid Denise or I ever leave the department, <laughs> there's anything that might be found or be be searched for later on. It's all in an email that everybody else has access to. Uh, da, da, da. <laughs> the subsidy hold list. So according to statute, subsidy funds can be withheld for non-compliance in multiple areas. Those areas are audits, uh, failing to submit the SAU or the municipal audit by the due date, extensions, failing to submit or maintain, highlight maintain a current extension request if the audit has not been completed by the due date, and MEFS, which is failing to upload uh, the required files into MEFS Neo by their respective due dates. Um, uh, so uh, on that note, extens <laughs> extensions and exceptions are available by request only. 
So there is, they're available on the DOE website. You literally can type it in and it'll pop right up. Um, and then the other thing is that we've kind of shifted this year because there is a short of, shortage of auditors. We know that audits are being pushed out and pushed out and pushed out. And still I'm getting some for the end of October, November. It's um, So it's okay to ask for a longer extension request. If you send me an extension request for the first three months, that's great. If you follow back up with me in three months and say, hey, I just talked to the auditor, it's going to be six more months till they even get back around to us. Tell me. I like send another request and say, hey, we've talked to them. It's going to be August 31st before we even see po the possibility. I like Denise and I have talked about this at, at length. It doesn't do, it's a lot easier for us and easier for you if that extension of once a month is not holding over your head for the whole year. Like it's just, it's stressful. It's a lot of legwork for me emailing 50 people a month trying to be like, hey, come on, let's go. So um, just keep that in mind. I, I would much rather hear your story and work with you guys and work with superintendents or whoever then it's just easier for everybody. We love to have a good relationship with you guys and we'd like to keep it as best we can. Um, I'm just gonna cut in real quick, a little commercial. Um, the main reason that we have to make sure we have these things in place and that we keep bugging you for them is that we get audited. You know, yes. we are audited about making sure we are complying and giving all this money out, this tax money, that we're in compliance with what we're going to do. So if we don't make sure that we get either an extension or the audit or all of these other things, we get a finding. Right. And we don't like that either. No, so, yeah. <laughs> um, but truly, I mean, we're all taxpayers, right? We all want to make sure that our tax money is being properly used. And so that's what this is about. It has nothing to do with wondering if you're doing your job properly. It has, it's just, you know, this is the way to make sure we are properly using those tax money. It has to be. Right, right. Um, and the other thing about it is like it's all about staying in compliance with the law and statutes, both federal and local. Um, so requesting an extension is tedious sometimes, but it takes a couple of minutes and it just it makes everybody's life easier rather than getting hounded or being in non-compliance and being threatened with the whole list and all that stuff. It's easier just to stay in and not have to worry about any of that. Um, so once the audit due date has passed, the audit extension requests uh, are necessary to remain in compliance until the audit is submitted. Um, I, I just said this, the initial audit request will be granted for three months. Um, again, if more time is needed, please submit an additional request uh, prior to the date but we can, again, on those longer time periods, uh, be approved on a case-by-case -case basis because it's just easier. Again, it's it's easier to keep everybody in compliance if we got, can all just work together. Um, again, with the audits and everything else, it goes to DOE audit at main.gov. Um, and then failure to submit an audit extension request may result in a withholding withholding a subsidy. Uh, it takes us a little while to get there. It's like if you don't respond to an email at all, you just ignore us for months, you might get there. Um, Believe it or not, <laughs> we have some people on the whole list. Yes. So, Regrettably, we don't want to do that. We really don't. And it's a, it's a lot of legwork to get back off the, the whole list. So we prefer not to do that. Sorry. Um, last but not least, Exceptions. Um, exceptions can be requested if your municipality does not operate a school. Um, so I don't know. The municipality does still need to submit the town audit. So I don't. We've kind of pulled back on the old requirement that it had to not be uh, this the audit, the school year end had to be 
different or the town year end had to be different than the fiscal year end of the school department or the state department. We no longer hold that standard. It, the, the fiscal year end of the town can be whenever. It's just, it's really more about the fact that if they do or don't operate a school. Um, audit exceptions are granted in three year increments. And um, I, I actually had this happen a couple weeks ago. Uh, somebody had, a school had requested an exception and then still sent me the school audit, which I thought was funny. Um, but you don't need to send that. If it's all one big package with this with the town audit, that's fine. Um, but yeah, the school audit at that point is no longer needed. So I don't know, might make your jobs easier if you know you're not having to deal with the school part of that one audit or not. Um, and again, those exception requests can be found on the website and emailed to doeaudit.atmain.gov. Can you give an example of, of when someone might need an exception request for the school? Sure. So an exception, like, or do we, I'm trying to think of one that doesn't have a school. Um, we have one back here. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So okay. So <laughs> Thank you. in those, in their case, those towns, they might be part of a bigger like AOS or different schooling unit, but within that town, they're still the town is still responsible for a school audit and a municipal audit, but they don't operate schools, so they can submit to us, even though they have students that they're paying to send elsewhere, they can submit to us an exception request. Okay. And then they don't have to do that school side, that school portion of the audit anymore. They just have to send us the town audit as a whole. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? 